pleasure to introduce uh, Jonathan Sleeman. I see that you've written a lot here, so I'm going to be oh, yeah, cut it down. briefly through it. Uh, he is currently the Centre Director for the US Geological Survey's National Wildlife Health Centre, and he's going to talk to us today about uh, emerging fungal diseases threaten the persistence of wildlife populations. Uh, well, thank you very much for the introduction. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, great, and um, it's, it's wonderful to be back. Um, I, I now live in the States, have been living there for about 25 years, so I don't get the opportunity to come back too often. And I think these symposia have been a fantastic idea that to get medics and vets from throughout the years from Churchill all together at the same time and, and, and share, share stories. Um, I have changed the name of the symposium to the Vet Medic Symposium. Um, I put vets first because it's well known that we're smarter than the medics. So. <laughs> I can see I might be outnumbered. So, um, as mentioned, I work for a, um, a federal government research facility. We focus on, on research on wild, wildlife diseases, and there really has been a, a major in, increase in, in, in interest in the diseases uh, that have a wildlife origin. Um, you've heard the discussion this morning about the Ebola outbreak in, in West Africa, and that's now been established that fruit bats are probably the reservoir and the potential mechanism by which, a potential vector of, of, that, of that pathogen. Um, we really are li living in a global environmental situation that's favoring the emergence of, of many different infectious diseases. And there's a number of different factors that we'll talk about as I go through my presentation. Um, you know, global travel and trade has broken down those barriers that used to prevent pathogens from jumping from one continent to another. Um, you know, changes in the use of land, increasing farming intensification, uh, increasing contact to humans, wildlife, domestic animals. All are creating the situation that's favoring and allowing the, or driving the emergence of infectious diseases. And you know, wildlife, the study of wildlife diseases was very much a neglected endeavor. If you go back in literature in the 1950s, there's very few publications on wildlife diseases, maybe some, some research on rabies and some others, but, but that has very much changed. Um, and, and not just from the basis of the majority of zoonotic diseases have a wildlife origin. But these diseases are having profound uh, and permanent impacts on wildlife populations and also on, on, on our, uh, the global economy. So this is very much illustrated by the types of diseases my home institution, the, the USGS, has investigated since our foundation in the 1970s. If you look at the top line, um, these are the types of diseases that we routinely investigated, avian cholera, um, avian botulism. They're very important to wildlife diseases. They can cause like tens of thousands of waterfowl to die in a single event, uh, but they usually remain confined to a small ge geographic area. Um, they're not zoonotic, they don't spill over into, wildlife, into, into livestock. Um, so really, they just have, a, have a, of a, a local interest. If you look from the 1990s, the first thing you notice is how crowded this line is. It seems every two or three years, we're, we're dealing with a new and emerging disease from the amphibian diseases of the early 90s to introduction of West Nile virus into the US in 1999. Uh, incursion of monkeypox in 2003, and so on and so forth. These diseases are also, also no longer remaining confined to, to, to smaller geographic areas. They spread very rapidly over large geographic uh, regions. So West Nile virus went from discovery in New York in 1999 to the west coast of the US in a period of four years. Um, chronic wasting disease has gone from being in one or two states to, 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 to now over half the states of the US have this disease in deer, deer and elk. Um, they're having far more profound Im impacts, as I mentioned. You know, they're causing species extinctions, uh, you know, from the amphibian chytriomycosis uh, to large-scale um, uh, population losses and dr drivers of extinction, like whiteness syndrome. And increasingly, um, uh, it's, uh, hopefully of interest, because it's a, a medic and vet uh, symposium, uh, have cross-sector in interest, right? So, so I think avian influenza is a classic example of this. Um, we know that waterfowl are the... Um, the reservoirs of low pathogenic avian influenzas, which are the progenitor of, progenitor of all human pandemic flu viruses. Uh, we know they can evolve into highly pathogenic forms, which can have profound impacts on commercial, commercial poultry operations um, uh, with billions of dollars of losses. And we now know these highly pathogenic viruses are spilled back into waterfowl, adapted, and these waterfowl can now transport these viruses uh, over large distances glo globally. And what I want to focus on is, is really the kind of three diseases that we've been um, uh, dealing with uh, most recently, which is white nose syndrome, snake fungal disease, and, and another chytrid fungus called B-cell in, in salamanders. 
And what's kind of interesting is, is the fact that these are all fungal infections. Um, and so I want to sort of discuss these, explore why these fungal diseases are driving uh, populations to extinction, what are the implications of, of, of that, and maybe some lessons learned we can all take home to our, to our practices. And as I mentioned, what's a particular concern of these, these fungal diseases is they've been really hard to anticipate or predict. Um, you know, fungal diseases aren't usually uh, uh, fatal. Uh, athlete's foot is irritating, but very rarely kills you. Um, and so the fact that they're causing these large-scale mortality events has been very surprising. Um, they, as I mentioned, they spread over large geographic areas. They're very difficult to manage. We have very few tools which to manage these diseases. And they're also, as I hope will illustrate, having some ecological ripple effects. But they aren't really confined. These um, emerging fungal infections are not confined just to wildlife pathogens. Um, there's a study done in, in, published in Nature in, in 2012 that showed that you're seeing an increase in prevalence of fungal, uh, uh, plant-infecting fungi, as well as other animal species. Um, and actually, there's, um, in the R Centers for Disease Control had a fungal awareness week, week, fungal disease awareness week back in August. And some of you probably know there are an increasing number of hospital-acquired fungal infections. Uh, we saw some of the more invasive procedures that are done more routinely, increasing opportunities for fungal infections in patients and hospitals. And also an uh, increasing number of community-acquired fungal infections. Um, we've had outbreaks of a, of a novel cryptococcus, cryptococcus gatti in, in, in the western US that seems to evolve into a more virulent strain and is increasing in, in, in geographic scope. The first fungal infection that was really recognized as a major cause of concern in wild, wild populations was this amphibian, amphibian chytriomycosis. It was first recognized in the 1990s. Uh, there was a researcher studying, studying the, the golden frog in Panama, uh, and they were doing this beautiful study watching the population dynamics and, and was able to monitor its, its, its um, decline from very abundant to an extinct species. And they never actually understood why initially. And then retrospectively, they, they found out it was actually this, this, this newly described fungus, Bactritrichium dendrobatidis. Um, it is, it's, it's a saprobic fungus, so it's, it's a decomposer. Um, it's from a group of fungi that were never previously described as pathogens of vertebrates. Um, it's, this fungus seems to have uh, has been a single lineage that spread globally. It's called this global uh, panzootic lineage. And it really was a, a, a game changer. It was, it's probably the largest a most severe infectious disease ever recorded amongst vertebrate species in terms of the number of species impacted, its propensity to drive species to extinction, as well as its global spread. It's been found in all continents except Antarctica. It's a very interesting life cycle. Uh, it has an aquatic uh, phase with these motile, you see the flagelli here, a zoospore, which initiates colonization of the host skin cells. Once they embed in the host skin cells, they develop into this thallus, Within this phallus, all the new zoospores will mature. This phallus will then move up um, to the surface of the skin, break open, and release the zoospores, and then complete, complete the infectious life cycle. So you're probably wondering how this actually kills the, 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 the infected host. Um, it's kind of interesting. They, these animals will develop um, a sort of skin infections. As I mentioned, the skin will become very thickened. You'll see the sort of reddening or erythema along the ventral surfaces of these frogs that are infected. They'll start losing the, right, the, the writing reflex, and then you'll see these, these, these large mortality events. And what's happening is this is a histopathological section of the skin of infected frogs. Uh, the skin will actually um, thicken, and skin in frogs, as you I don't remember, are very important for ga gas exchange and water balance. And so, so if, the, if that skin is thickened, it's like having pneumonia, right? And so, 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 so it, so it um, makes it more difficult to, 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 to perform gas exchange, these important physiological functions. And it's also like having kidney failure because they can't exchange salts and, and, and regulate the, the, the water balance. So that, that's why we think it's an extremely fatal infection in these frogs. So the big question is how is it spread globally um, as I mentioned, phylogenetically, it seems to be a single, single clone or sing, single hybrid that's spread quite rapidly across the globe. And the most likely hypothesis is, is for two reasons. Um, if you go to the supermarket and purchase frog legs to consume, it's most likely American bullfrogs that you're, that you're eating. There's very large uh, commercial farms, particularly in South America, that produce the vast majority of frogs for the commercial trade. These bullfrogs are known to be resistant to this fungus. 
and are able then to move it to cross continents. Of course, when they import live frogs into other continents, they, they will escape and then obviously introduce the disease in, into the wild. The other major mechanism is, I don't know what was the case in the UK, but in the US in the 1960s, used to use African clawed frogs as a pregnancy test for, for women. So you take the urine of a pregnant woman, you inject it into the frog. If they get fol follicular development, it was indicated that the woman was, was, was pregnant. And of course, these frogs were then just, just let loose after they were used for the diagnostic test and became established and have spread the disease. One of the biggest challenges we have is, is, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, is we really don't have any good tools in which to manage the, these, these infections. Um, there are some recommendations from the OIE, which is the World Organization for Animal Health. Uh, they recommend only shipping frozen meat to prevent the transmission of this fungus. They, they have certain recommendations regarding treatment and quarantine of live animals before they're shipped globally. Um, it's one of the few diseases that's notifiable, animal disease that's notifiable, that's, that's, that's specific to wildlife. Again, the idea to try and um, allow for early detection, surveillance, and rapid response in the case of introduction of a disease. But we're already left with, with habitat management for the remaining wildlife populations. And for those critically endangered species, uh, establishment of captive colonies uh, and assurance colonies and captive breeding, breed, breeding programs. The next disease that I want to talk about is white nose syndrome in bats. Um, so about 10 years ago, um, we got reports from our partners in New York. They were noticing these insectivorous hibernating bats were out flying outside caves in New York in the wintertime. This is extremely unusual behavior for bats. Um, that, as I mentioned, they're insectivorous. Um, there's no food for them in the winter. They usually spend the winter hibernating. So we sent a team out to do an investigation and, and found that these bats um, covered in this white fuzzy material, especially around their muzzles, hence the name of the disease. But also you can see along here on the, the non-furred parts of the skin, particularly the wings and the feet and the ears. But more dramatically, it was associated with these very large scale uh, mortality events. You, I don't know what you can see, but you can see the number of bats here scattered along, dead bats scattered along the, the cave floors. In the US, uh, bats hibernate in very large colonies, or used to hibernate in very large colonies. It's not, not uncommon to have a, a colony of 100,000 bats in one location. And these, these colonies were, were almost completely extirpated. So, so it went down. 99.9% .9 of the bats were lost um, from this disease. And so about, about 7 million hibernating bats in the US have now been killed as a consequence of white nose syndrome. A number of species are modeled to go locally extinct in the next 15 years. Uh, and it really has been quite a devastating disease. It was first found here in New York, uh, just outside Albany, in a, in a cave system, and then has spread um, quite rapidly from there and now into 26 states. It's found as far west as Washington State. Uh, it's now in the Texas Panhandle uh, and several Canadian, Canadian provinces. The, the colors just represent the different years in which it was first detected in that geographic location. So there really seems to be no ge geographic barrier to prevent its, its spread across the continental US. It's a really kind of interesting uh, uh, um, sort of disease investigation story. So, so we collected some of these carcasses. We took them back to our lab for investigation. And by the time we got to lab, this white fungal material, fuzzy material, had disappeared. And we ran a whole bunch of diagnostic tests, you know, did sort of bacterial cultures, virus isolation, parasitological exams, toxicology screening, really couldn't find anything consistent. Then our microbiologist at the time uh, rather astutely decided to put his cultures into the fridge to replicate these cave environments, right? So normally you put these cultures in at 20 degrees, or well, body temperature, 37 degrees. He put his cultures in the fridge, and lo and behold, started to isolate this, get a single isolate, which, which turned out to be the, 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 the fungus that's causing this disease. It was characterized by these very unique curved conidia, and, we've, and again, it's, a, it's from a family of fungi that are not known to be, be pathogens of vertebrates. Uh, we've called it Pseudogymnoascus destructans, destructans because it's extremely de destructive. So again, how does this fungus kill, kill bats? So it's an extremely invasive fungus. These are histopathological sections of the wings of bats. The darker purple or pink color is this fungus. And you can see, actually, it's not just a surface a colonizer. It invades deeply down into the underlying connective tissues. Um, and rather like our frogs, these wings are very important for, for various other physiological functions, like, like heat regulation, uh, water control, salt regulation, gases exchange and blood pressure regulation. So, 
So once again, this, this, this sort of disruption of the tegument leads to the disruption of these important physiological functions. Also causes the bats to arouse whilst they're hibernating. They use their fat reserves and therefore often can't, will end up not being able to survive uh, hibernation. The other kind of unique thing, is anyone, is anyone a pathologist in the audience? What, what do you see that's unique about, what's kind of unusual? I'm putting you on the spot, aren't I? Well, compared to what we expect if you saw a sort of invasive fungus coming into tissues. Yeah, exactly. There's no inflammatory response. You know, smart. I can tell she's from Cambridge. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're not sure why, whether there's fungus uh, issues, sort of immunosuppressive factors, or the fact these bats, uh, uh, their human system is naturally downregulated during hibernation. But there seems to be a major reason why these, these fungus can invade large parts of the body very quickly and cause mortality. So it's kind of interesting. So when we started publishing this information, we started getting contacts by colleagues in Europe saying, hey, we've seen bats with the same sort of clinical signs as white fuzzy material uh, on, on our species, but we don't see the same level of mortality. Um, so we asked them to send us some samples, and we grew them up in our lab, and, and, sh and sure enough, it's the exact same fungus as what's found in, in North American bats. Um, the big difference is in European bats, there's no, no sign of any mortality. And it's now being found very widely across uh, the European continent Actually, even, I think, here in, here in the UK, too. Again, we're not sure why this fungus does not kill uh, uh, European bats. There may be some differences in species susceptibility. European bats tend to be bigger bodied, may be able to survive uh, wintertime. The winters aren't as harsh here as, as some parts of the uh, um, uh, Northeast and Midwest United States. Uh, they tend to col um, live in smaller colonies. There's an interesting theory that, that actually that this fungus may have come through European bat populations several centuries ago um, because the bat populations in Europe are much, much smaller compared, compared to North America, and these may be the remnant survivors of this historic out, outbreak. But then we did some, again some phylo, phylo, geo, um, uh, phylo, phylogeny or phylogeography of the, the different isolates that were sent to us, um, looking at the sort of genetic relationship of these different strains. Um, and these, this is all the European strains, uh, which show a sort of a fair amount of genetic diversity, you know, 18,000 single nuclide polymorphisms. These are all the strains that we found in North America, and you can see that there's very little genetic diversity between these different strains. So this, again, is very likely a, a, a single strain, a single point origin infection that's somehow come over to, to, the, to the US and then has spread clonally across, across, uh, across the continent. So the big question is, how did it get into the United States? Well, again, we're not entirely sure, but the most likely hypothesis is that um, a caver in Europe uh, was caving, probably collected some of the fungi, the spores, uh, on the caving equipment of boots, came over into the United States, went caving in the US, and somehow introduced the fungus into our cave environments here. And there's... The, the, the index site of this infection is actually a, a very popular commercial cave that gets several hundred thousand visitors each year. So um, the cavers aren't too happy when we, when we, when we say this, but that this is probably the most likely way that this fungus got in. So again, an interesting illustration of how global travel can result in the spread of these in, infectious diseases. Like chytriomycosis in, 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 in frogs, we have very few good management tools. Uh, this fungus persists very well in the cave sediments, and the cave environments, making any disease control efforts extremely difficult. Um, these cave environments, I don't know how many spelunkers are there in the audience, but these cave environments are very complex. So being able to go in and treat bats and provide, you know, distribute biological, apply biological agents is going to be very difficult. So right now we're working actually on a potential vaccine. Um, we've done a whole genomic sequencing of the fungus. We've uh, identified the genes that stimulate immunity, uh, the responsible path pathology and stimulate immunity. We're working on a potential a recombinant vaccine, uh, splicing those genes into a raccoon pox uh, base. Re pox virus is very good for oral replication in the muc mucosal membrane, so very good for oral delivery of vaccines. We're actually adapting a technique that's used to kill vampire bats in South America. Uh, vampire bats are considered pests. They feed on livestock. They spread rabies. And so they actually apply a, a paste to the back of these bats with a warfarin-based poison. Uh, bats are social groomers, so you don't have to uh, treat every single bat. Um, just re reintroduce them back in the colony. They'll groom this material off each other and end up, in the case of vampire bats, killing them all, 
but hopefully in the case of Weiner syndrome, um, will, will result in, in you know, population level immunity through vaccination. Uh, so right now we're, we're, we're doing actually, right now literally doing um, laboratory trials with this vaccine to see if it actually, actually works. And then if it does, we'll hopefully do some, some field trials. Now, sometimes in my job, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's, we have a hard time getting people to care. Um, you know, bats are a known reservoir, as we mentioned about Ebola, for a number of, of nasty zoonotic diseases. Uh, and so we spend quite a bit of time sort of, sort of trying to provide evidence for why it's important that we should care about these, these different, this biodiversity in these different species. Uh, bats are actually kind of interesting in that they are a sort of ecological keystone species. They're very important predators of a number of different insects, particularly moths that predate and destroy forest products, as well as insects like beetles that destroy uh, agricultural crops. And so they provide a very important ecological service through this insect control. And we've done some studies to show that they contribute up to $50 billion to the US economy, agricultural economy, through their insect control services, not just from, from protecting crops, but also from the reduced, reduced use of pesticides that would have to apply if bats didn't, didn't exist. How many people drink, drink margarita? Nobody? <laughs> Three people? Oh my gosh. You, need, you lead shelters' lives. Well, well margarita is made from tequila, right? And tequila is made from the agave plant. And the agave plant, the only reason the agave plant is it, it, pollinated is by a single bat species. So no bats, no agave, no tequila, which you don't care about, obviously. <laughs> And then there may be some indirect human health implications. They also feed on mosquitoes, which are well-known vectors for a number of, of, of different um, uh, zoonotic or, or, or vector-borne diseases in, in people. Well, that's much harder, uh, as we've discovered, to actually quantify. Um, it's, I know it's hard to get people to care about bats. I've not actually had much luck getting people to care about snakes. <laughs> but, but they are again, important members of these ecosystems. And again, around the same time that we're dealing with white nose syndrome, we started getting reports of very severe fungal infections in these snakes, especially the crotalids and the vipers, uh, the rattlesnakes. Um, we have a number of endangered rattlesnake species in the US for <laughs> reasons maybe obvious because people kill them, they don't like them. Um, but what, what got our attention is these, this, this, uh, this snake fungal disease was causing a very high mortality in these populations. As you can see, it causes a pre-marked disfiguration of the face. It can cause, it can invade into the eyes and cause blindness, and obviously you can see why these, these animals perish. Again, there's a single fungus that's associated with these outbreaks, Ophidiomyces ophidiocola. Um, this is an endemic, ubiquitous fungus. If I went outside and cultured the soil here, we probably would find, find, find some. Um, I, I, again, it was, you know, we're a little uncertain if this was a primary pathogen or just potential uh, uh, opportunistic pathogen. So we, we went ahead and did infection trials in, in corn snakes. Well, we actually excoriated the scales of some snakes, inf infected them with some fungal spores from Ophidiomyces. Ophidia cola obviously had controls. And we're able to replicate the infection. You can see the control. Again, nice clean skin. You can see the affected animal. You can see the cupping lesions of the invasive fungus. And we were able to replicate the different stages of the disease from the kind of discoloration of the scales to the, some, some of the uh, more severe lesions to the, actually the granulometers sort of swellings and, uh, and abscesses. What we also noticed in our infected snakes is they exhibited sort of different behavior compared to the controls. We saw a lot more increased frequency of, of shedding of the skin. And they're a lot more active. They spend a lot more time basking in the warmth, presumably to stimulate the, the natural immune system. We think the shedding is an attempt to, sh to, sh to shed the infection or rid themselves of the infection. This is a, a section of skin uh, with a silver stain to show that fungal hyphae. So you can see how separating that skin removes most of the infection. But for some of these deeper infections, even skin shedding did not eliminate the infection. And so once it reaches a certain depth, uh, unfortunately, this infection to remain and, and, and becomes invariably fatal. So this is, again, an interesting sort of conundrum in, in that we've known about snake fungal disease, uh, at least the lesions are caused by snake fungal disease since the 1960s, and was generally ignored because it was considered a very mild in, infection. Um, and only really since the 2000s has we started to see more severe infections and actually a population level effect of this fungus. Um, and then the other interesting fact is if you look at it, this kind of spatiotemporal spread, unlike white-nose syndrome where you've got this 
point source and, and clear radiation from the point source, um, the ge geographic discovery and distribution is a lot more random. So you can see down in Florida, up in the north, northeast, in the Midwest, the Great Lakes, the kind of central, central Midwest. Um, there really is no consistent uh, uh, pattern here. So this appears to be a, an example of an endemic pathogen that somehow is evolving to become a more vir virulent strain. Uh, and we're not entirely sure why. Uh, we've got anecdotal evidence that we see more severe infections in geographic locations that have um, summers that are wetter and more cloudy which you can imagine are sort of conducive for good fungal growth. Um, one can argue about the causes of climate change, but one cannot argue with the fact that the past 20 years or so, we have seen a general increase uh, in the global uh, uh, monthly temperatures, um, actually quite, quite dramatic increases. So our hypothesis right now is we believe this is an impact of climate change. So these climates are changing. We've seen war we're seeing warmer, wetter, cl cloudier summers, which are more conducive to, the, to fungal growth. And the last disease I want to touch upon is, is another chytrid fungus, which is Bacteritrichitrium salamandrovorans, which is uh, related to the frog fungus, except it kills salamanders. This was uh, discovered uh, several years ago uh, here in Europe. Um, it was, it's an endemic pathogen to, to Asia. It was introduced into Europe via the pet trade. It's now caused some fairly mock die-offs of European salamanders, particularly the fire salamander in sort of Belgium. Holland, Netherlands. Um, it's kind of interesting that it causes slightly different clinical presentation compared to frogs, where you see more of an uh, ulceration, necrosis of the skin versus the thickening and reddening of the, of the skin. This is a nice example, though, where we're actually, actually trying to take a proactive approach. So right now, we do not believe this fungus is present in, the, in North America. We're very concerned about its potential introduction because we have the highest biodiversity of salamanders in the entire world particularly in, in, in the southeast of the United States, about up to 25 different species of salamanders, including some pretty unique species like hellbenders and mud puppies, which are found nowhere else in the world. And so actually, we did a risk, risk assessment about the potential introduction of this disease. Um, we looked at um, the potential susceptibility of, of North American species and, and found that several uh, could be susceptible. We looked at where the uh, populations at high risk were we looked at the likely ports of entry based on data of Im importation of amphibians, you know, obviously um, you know, Atlanta, New York, California, uh, Chicago, and basically produced this heat map of, of relative risk of the potential introduction of this fungus, and now doing sort of risk-based early, detec early detection surveillance at these sites. The idea being if we can find it, hopefully we can stamp it out before it spreads too, 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 much, too much further. It's also interesting in that um, in the US we have the Lacey Act, the Lacey Act was passed uh, several decades ago. It gives the US Fish and Wildlife Service the ability to declare a species injurious. It, it was designed to, to prevent the introduction of invasive species into the US. And they've actually used our study to, and then used the Lacey Act to declare some species of salamander, salamanders injurious. Not because the salamanders themselves could be dangerous, but because the potential pathogen that they're carrying could be dangerous. It's the first time the Lacey Act has been used to prohibit the potential introduction of, of a pathogen. So why, why fungal infections? Well, well, I think there's several factors that really lead to, as someone mentioned the perfect storm earlier, why they are, are, are causing such, such profound impacts on wildlife populations. They have a very high virulence uh, with a very high mortality rate in the species that they infect. They have a great ability to undergo genetic uh, change, recombination. Unlike bacteria and viruses, they have a, a sexual and asexual reproductive cycle, which allows them to, to hybridize, allows them to undergo these genetic exchanges and, and adapt readily to new environments. They have these long-lived environmental stages, uh, even in the absence of the host. So the bad news about Whitener syndrome is, is most of these cave environments are now empty because all the bats are gone, but the fungus remains, and so if bats come back, they'll likely get, get reinfected. And so, so making a real challenge, obviously, for the recovery of these species. Um, they tend to be generalists, right? They don't, they don't specify or just specifically uh, attack a particular species. And again, the BD, or chytrid fungus, is known to affect over 500 species. And, and as we've shown with the, with the chytrid fungus, they have these reservoirs of community super spreaders that can re remain unaffected uh, and can spread the, the infection quite rapidly. 
I think in terms of kind of like the bigger picture take home messages, it's kind of interesting what, what kind of lessons can we learn from, from these emerging diseases. Well, I think the, the great illustrators, I go back to the beginning of my presentation of the various drivers of these emerging diseases, you know, be it global trade in amphibians, be it global travel of, of, of cavers, be it climate change, be it land use change, we're seeing a very complex pattern and complex causes of these emergence of these infections. It's really a, creating a wonderful opportunity for these microbes to adapt and evolve to new, new, new species and new geographic areas. But it's also creating a real challenge in terms of how we manage these things. There's not a, not a silver bullet. There's going to be different strategies that are going to be necessary for management of these, these, these different diseases. It gets me just a little bit to, to my home institution, the National Wildlife Health Center. Uh, it's a little hubristic, but we sometimes refer ourselves to the CDC for Wildlife. We have an integrated program of, of, of diagnostic labs that does pathogen discovery and characterization. We have a team of epidemiologists to do outbreak investigations and the design surveillance we talked about. And we have research that are developed doing a lot. We have strengths in disease modeling, and kind of develop, development of predictive models. Can we get a deeper understanding of these drivers and anticipate and predict where they're going to emerge and actually try and prevent them emerging in the first place, as well as development of these management tools like the vaccines. So we, we do a lot of work on early detection, rapid response surveillance, as we talked about. Uh, we have real strengths in Bayesian modeling uh, because it allows us to incorporate the uncertainty in model, model selection and working very hard to integrate models uh, or data from various sources into these integrated models. And as I mentioned, the, you know, we have a program in vaccine development. And this is another vaccine we developed to vaccinate prairie dogs against the sylvatic plague, which is a major issue in grassland ecosystems in the western US. And somebody, somebody men mentioned CRISPR-Cas9. We, too, are looking at this technology. Um, you can actually modify the, 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 the germ lines of these different species. So you can actually, there's a lot of interest in, in, in uh, this in, in invasive species control because you can make daughterless populations and so can, can, can eradicate populations very quickly. But can we use the same technology to make species disease, resi disease resistant? Uh, and so it's really much in its exploratory phase. There's a lot of concern about the genetic modification and gene editing of vertebrate species and then releasing them into the environment um, uh, and the potential unintended consequences. But I think it's a technology that could revolutionize our ability to manage these diseases. And I think just to sort of, you know, kind of final message is, is this concept of One Health. Uh, we very much work in this environment, as I mentioned. We work very closely with our counterparts in public health and, and, vet, and vet, veterinary uh, health, particularly in the agriculture. Um, you know, One Health is, is defined as this collaborative effort of multiple disciplines working to obtain optimal outcomes for, for people, animals, the environment. And the, the concept of human health, wildlife health, domestic animal health are all interconnected within the context of ecosystem health. And I think kind of my key message, I hope, is that, is that you know, this, the, the biodiversity is very important for the maintenance of human health and maintenance, you know, this loss of biodiversity does jeopardize the ecosystems upon, upon which all life depends. That's all I have. I thank you for listening, and if we have time, I'll take some questions. So next, I will introduce Yvette Godwin, matriculated in 1982, who's a humanitarian plastic surgeon working with MSF, Doctors Without Borders. It was touch and go whether she could be here today, as she was due to be sent out for a humanitarian mission any day now, and there was talk even of doing this by Skype, but thankfully she was able to attend. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, and thank you very much to the previous speakers for some amazing talks. Um, today I'd like to speak to you about being a humanitarian plastic surgeon, and I appreciate that those two words don't really sit very comfortably together, as the majority of people will see plastic surgeons as delving into the science of fluffy gauze, tight smiley faces and Botox. I hope by the end of this talk that you'll see that we are actually able to do other things. So how did I come about becoming a plastic surgeon? Well, I was a comprehensive school kid. I came to Churchill completely by chance. I sat my entrance exam because my mate Steve wanted someone to revise with. We were not chosen by our school to sit Oxbridge. We were not encouraged by our school to sit Oxbridge. We were two precocious 17-year-olds, and I was lucky enough to get in. I was accepted to read natural science. I then, and thanks to Churchill, 
opened my eyes, saw what medicine was about, and was fortunate enough to become a transfer medic. I spent some time overseas as a junior, and to all the juniors in the room now, and all the um, undergraduates, that's an ex exhausted SBR, a registrar, and that's how we used to do a one in two to one in one on call. You just took your sleep where you could. And finally, in 2011, I left my consultant post to do the humanitarian work that I now do. So what was the plan? These were my naive goals. I was going to choose a charity. I was going to return regularly to one project. I was going to bring the staff to medical independence and know when to leave. What was the big surprise? Well, it's not actually you that decides where you go and what you do. The charities will tell you what you're going to treat, where you're going to go, and how often you're allowed to go. Charities naturally have goals. They have to fund themselves somehow. And the number of patients you treat, the patient profile, hence why a lot of cleft lip and palate um, charities are very visible through their marketing, is important to the charity. They have to earn money. And in this era of super specialization, the charity may not necessarily check your um, skill set. So it's really up to you to make sure you're being sent to the right place where you can help. If you're a hand surgeon, there is no point in going on to a cleft lip and palate project. So as a surgeon, what choices are left to you? Well, basically, you have to have some moral compass and you only do overseas what you would do at home. Never think you're the only doctor who's going to turn up and just do something because you think nobody else will. The patients can't afford your mistakes and the charities can't afford your bungles. So before you start any project, once you're there, make sure you know what kit you have and what interventions you can offer. Look at what you have for backup. Do you have wards? Do you have long-term follow-up? Do you have physios? And most of all, if you're doing a speciality like plastic, where a lot of the operations are staged, you need to know if you're going to come back, if you're going to do a staged procedure. So what were my goals for me? Well, to set it up well, follow it up, do the right surgery for the right case, do it well, do it once, zero complications and zero revisions. So no pressure there. What dictates the surgery I can actually do? Well, it's very much the team, the kit, the environment and the actual patients. Surgeons are pretty useless doctors. If we don't have kit and team, there's not a lot we can do. And the good thing about plastic surgery is if I stuff that little lot into a backpack and add that to any basic set, I can do the most complex plastic surgery, including free tissue transfer. So this is where I go. This is Gaza Beach Resort. And there I do mainly hand surgery, burn surgery, post-trauma reconstruction, and breast surgery as linked to both trauma and cancer. One of the most important parts of my job is to try and encourage getting the right case to the right surgeon, and therefore I network on the internet and I get to know the local NGOs. So how do I do it? Well, this is the NHS in Gaza. This is the MOH, Ministry of Health situation. This is the theater at the end of the case. You can see the little leg on the table. Patient isn't even in recovery yet. Everything gets thrown on the floor. There are no trained theatre nurses, just technicians. And at the end of the case, some poor little dude has to come in and pick up all the sharps and all the mess and all the blood and put it into a black dustbin bag. These are my precision instruments from Edinburgh after three washes, covered with human debris, rusted, and they went straight in the bin. And this is a Burns ward round for all the vets. This is the local stray cat that comes to visit us in this highly sterile situation. So how can you improve on this environment while still remembering you are just a visitor? Well, you try to bring in what's missing and you try to teach. The NGO, whoever you go on a mission with, will bring you support through logistics. You can treat a group of local people up to the standards you need. And in surgery, obviously, that is cleanliness and professionalism. If you have a speciality such as plastics and you need rehabilitation, you have to make sure that the aftercare and the continuity of care is in place. So here is my team. All the boys at the back are my nurses and the two little guys at the front in the red hats are the expatriates, the anaesthetist and the surgeon. This is the tent we operate in. It's a cast off from Haiti and it's in a car park. The front part that you see is where all the families and friends sit, sip tea 
whilst we operate inside that tent. And inside, you'll be surprised, it's quite nice, really. We have a fairly good theatre. And this is the star of the show. This is our hygienist. This is the guy who looks after our instruments and our sterility. And that first dreadful theatre that you saw with all the litter on the floor, this is how he turns it around to a place where I can actually put in metalwork and implants without risk of infection. That's how you wear a mask when you've got a beard like that. These are our nurses. They have been trained just like European nurses. They've been trained by expatriates from France. They know how to wear gloves. They know how to deal with sharps. And they certainly know how to set up a theatre table. And incidentally, all that bit of Dean splattered at the front, that was me. They know how to take notes. They know how to document. So when you're in a situation such as Gaza, you have to do surgical reconstruction. And the ideal reconstruction would be a one-stage procedure with minimal donor site morbidity, no complications, minimal rehab, and maximal outcome. The challenges I face is I have no inpatient stay. All my patients are outpatients. The patients are quite different, both culturally and in the way they heal. And the other thing I have to contend with is I'm not there all the time. I come and I go. So I have to cope with the missions, but with also the gaps between what will happen to my patients during that time. So just to give you an example, and I will use hand surgery throughout this talk to illustrate that hand surgery is not the only thing I do. I also would like to warn the audience at this stage that there are some intraoperative pictures. So um, if you're a little bit sensitive, I apologize. Um, so just taking hand surgery as an example, if your patients are outpatients, I do an operation, the hand is going to swell. How am I going to get the hand elevated? There are no slings. My nurses are the actual patient's family. I have to educate them how to elevate the hand, how to monitor, and how to contact me if there's mischief. Pain control. The strongest analgesia in Gaza is paracetamol. We're not allowed opiates. So both me and my anaesthetist have to be quite expert in performing local blocks to ensure analgesia when the patient is home. Temperature. We get four hours of electricity a day, and then we're down to generators. That means most of the patients will have no fans, no air conditioning. And in the summer, the temperature can go up to 45 degrees. That's a lot of sweating in dressings. My hemostasis has to be meticulous, because if I don't, I'm going to get a bleed at home. And what's worse, there is curfew, and I cannot take patients back to theatre at night. So we're back to the zero complication surgery. So, what are the patient's needs in Gaza? How do they differ? You will find throughout most of the developing world, amputation through religious and cultural reasons is refused, irrespective of function and danger. Cosmesis can be very much more imp important than you actually imagine it's going to be. They worry a lot about scars. Both hyper and hypopigmentation is very badly received. Function can be surprisingly low in the patient's goals in what they're trying to achieve from their surgery. And getting married can be a primary goal for women because if they are disfigured in any way and cannot get married, they have no income and no support after their parents die. So how do we do surgery in Gaza? Well, we work as a team. We try and restore function and we follow up. But most of all, we restore function bearing aesthetics in mind. We try to make it look good. And we take a new take on limb surgery in that normally you would aim for function. But if a patient has an osteomyelitis in a totally useless leg and is refusing amputation, you will eradicate the osteomyelitis and reconstruct even though you're not going to get function back because you're preventing sepsis. So what kind of cases do I get? I deal with trauma and mainly congenital abnormality. And in the trauma, I don't have a hospital, so I'm not dealing with the acute cases. I'm dealing with the consequence of either missed primary management or the consequences of that missed primary man management, such as contracture. Again, using hands as an example, in congenital hands, we see a lot of problems because genetics are entirely different in this closed community. People cannot leave Gaza, therefore they will marry their first cousin. And this is an example of post-axial polydactyly, i.e. multiple small fingers. In Europe, I would see this as largely a small nubbins on the outside of the small finger. Here, just like at Tesco's, you get three for one. And it's my job to somehow unravel that mess, share out the tendons, share out the arteries, 
share out the bones, and somehow get something that's still going to bend and go straight again. With funny little hands, I see funny little toes. And if you do a quick count up there, you'll see things aren't entirely right. And if I'm really lucky, I get six of everything on the same kid. And then you have to do the same operation four times. It takes you three and a half hours, and the charity gets very grumpy because that's only one candidate that went through that day. We also see a lot of syndactyly, which is hereditary with variable, with variable penetrance. And although it does impart functional impairment, one of the main worries here is marriage. If your ring finger is stuck to your middle finger, you can't wear a wedding ring. So we separate it with a few flaps and some graphs, V for victory, it's all going well. But we also have to take into consideration in the first world, we would follow this up, we would check the dressings, there, we have to do it more frequently. A failed operation costs far more than just leaving things alone and never starting. As I've explained before, temperatures soar, we need to do regular dressing changes in the summer. And what's more, my little gazans are super non-compliant, and if you give them a dressing to poke about, they will do it. And here we have a child who's only three days after the surgery, and it's all been wrapped up in sellotape, and it's 40 degrees. So what do we want? We want good function and we want good scars. We want well-balanced webs that can wear ring fingers. What we don't want is revision on revision. And if you look at this case, you'll see there is a small V scar, it's followed by a small square scar, followed by a web space which is still gradually creeping up the finger. This has already had three revisions. So we give it one last one and that we hope, inshallah, this time around, this will be the last one. So, in Gaza, I see a lot of revision surgery because cases jump from one NGO to another. My patients have a very hard time sticking with one charity. This is an example of an acrosyndactyly or a little spoon hand. You'll see there, there are too many fingers and they are all joined together. In 2014, I released the board of fingers. Then my kid disappeared, didn't come back for follow-up. Then 10 months later, he suddenly reappeared and his little fingers are all jammed together. They've been separated, but they haven't been separated quite well enough. So we have to wait for the scars to mature. We do a revision. We correct the contraction as best we can and recreate the webs. And this is how we've ended up. He's five years old now. And although the hands are not beautiful, they are functional. <laughs> And that's the best we can do for this little man. And once again, the issue of consanguinity. There we are, mum and son, both with the same condition. This is what we don't want to see. This is the occasional syndactyly surgeon doing a complex syndactyly. And here, no doubt, the digital vessels have been damaged, leading to this necrosis. All we can do in this situation, since I thought those digits may well end up with amputation, is patiently dress them and allow them to heal in. But the result is not only non-functional, but totally non-aesthetic. It's the left hand, index, and middle finger. They are stuck down as they were before any attempted separation. And the worst thing, because vascular injury has taken place, I cannot revise those digits. So the bottom line is if you go and do humanitarian work, if you can't lift it, don't try, and everybody remains happy. If it's not your field, don't do it. If you don't have the kit, don't try it. And if you can't correct or meet the patient's expectations, listen to them and be honest. Finally, if another NGO is doing a top job, don't think you can do better. So what trauma do I see in Gaza? I see chronic wounds for which no primary treatment has been given. War is intermittent there every two to four years. But after war, I see the problems of poverty, overcrowding in rooms, primus stoves and candles. I see contracture, where the injury, the original injury hasn't received the right treatment. And then I see contracture because the treatment given was maybe the wrong treatment. The population that gets damaged is also a young population, and they can outgrow the treatment they've been given with time. So you need to follow up, you need to revise. Common causes of injury in Gaza are burns, road traffic accidents, and war. 
The scolds can be far worse than the ones we see in Europe because every drink is absolutely full of sugar. 17 spoons I've counted to one teapot. They don't have electricity, so they have some really rubbish generators that explode. And these are the kind of flame burns that are commonly seen on the adult hands. All over the developing world, most of the electricity is brought to the households by this mix of spaghetti and they get surges and the children get burns on their hands such as this. You are more likely to die of a road traffic accident as a humanitarian than a bomb or a gunshot. Gaza is no exception for road traffic accidents and they have no sense of danger on the roads. As you can see, little sea trip here, one kid bouncing through the sunroof of the car, no seat belt, and the other one on the right hand side is basically walking the streets. This is a road with cars going down it. He's unaccompanied. Nobody ever wears a seat belt, even if it's available. The next cause of trauma in Gaza is war, and that's why they tell you to hide under the staircase. From that, we mainly see loss of digit and shrapnel injury. So going back to burns, I see the semi-acute, i.e. the delayed presentation and the chronic contracture. The semi-acute, when it turns up at my screening, it's all wrong. The timing is completely out of whack. The semi-acute injury is open. By the time I see it, it is too late for primary reconstruction. Yet it's too early for delayed reconstruction because if I use a donor site now and get a recontracture, I've burnt a bridge that I can't retrace. So the aim is to get the wound closed, get a good physio onto the case, review the patient, and then see if operation is necessary. So this is an example of an electric burn. Now, all burns should be healed at 10 days in a burns unit in, in Europe. Here we have a small child who has been suffering dressings for a month and the wound is still wide open. In less than three dressing changes under ketamine sedation, I can virtually get that wound closed. We then have to stretch it using our physio, our splints and aftercare. Once I see that child again in nine months to a year, if he's got a simple band like that, I can release it by a Z-plasty. If the skin is badly damaged, I can change it to a full thickness skin graft. And if it's the first web space and the index finger has not been burnt, I can drop a flap into the web space. And that's the one my Gazaeans love the most because it's cosmetic, and if it's cosmetic, they love it. Sometimes you have to operate, even though the timing of surgery is totally non-ideal. And my MOH surgeons, my colleagues, they're little mischiefs. They do this every mission. Just when I'm about to go, they bring out some badly traumatized patient that they've been hiding for the last eight weeks. It's like at any firework display, the big firework is always the last one. So here's my big firework. This poor guy has been burnt three months ago. Most of his burn will have been full thickness or partial, deep partial thickness. He's been having dressings for three months with no analgesia, and of his 25% burn, he is still 17% open. So we've got three days of the mission left. We swab him to check that he's not crawling with streptococcus. We excise him and we graft him. And here he is two years down the line. Sure, he's scarred, but he's a lot less scarred than if we'd let this heal by secondary intention. And please note, he has a little pot belly. He is so beautiful that he now has a second wife, hence the pot belly. And his donor site on his leg is healed in such a way that you can barely see that I took the skin. One of my biggest frustrations in the developing world is when I see things like this. These are donor sites. These were not the original injury. These are scars produced by surgeons, either NGOs or local, to reconstruct another area in patients who are basically scar phobic. This is unforgivable, and I cannot reverse it. The same with the overmeshing of skin graft. The local people call this crocodile skin. I was brought this little one to revise. There is absolutely nothing I can do. So my physio is my right-hand man. When surgery isn't possible or I'm away, he maintains range of movement until I come back, and he can actually reduce the amount of surgery I need to do. This is the man from the generator that exploded. He's 60 years old when he sustained this burn. That is a not good time of life to damage your hands. But however, with the use of my physio, he has full extension and virtually full flexion except for a small finger. This is the same injury in one of my patients from Mumbai. 
with no splintage and no physiotherapy. So you can see the difference of having good colleagues. This is just to show you the range of movement that my okay. road gentleman has. And again. So he has developed a standing range of motion simply by input from my physiotherapist. I will tell you what the next two slides are. So because he has got that range of movement, the only digits I had to treat were his small finger and his ring finger. And simply by excising the burn on the back of the digit and replacing that with a full thickness skin graft, he subsequently got a full range of motion of that hand. So he got full range of movement of that hand, showing that if you had the cooperation, the follow-up of your staff, you can progress the patient without having to, to always operate. However, if you just operate without that kind of follow-up, you will have the kind of problems that I would like to show you now. Okay, so there he is with his swan neck deformity of his ring finger and small finger that won't go down. We popped on a full thickness skin graft. There we are, all his fingers going down, no problem. We also treated his first web spice. And as you can see, the actual depth of the burn there is one centimeter, that's one deep burn. So we put a little full thickness graft on for him there. So what I mentioned before, amputation being refused. This can be considered by many patients as simply not an option irrespective of the problem the digit or limb is giving them. This applies both to upper, lower limbs and digits. For instance, this lady is 31 years old. She sustained her injury 20 years ago, and she comes to me wanting me to sort out that little finger. The ideal treatment there in Europe would be what we call a ray amputation, which is very cosmetic and very functional. It's amputation, so it was refused. So this is an example of listening to your patient. She knew that if we released that finger, there was a chance the vascularity wouldn't take the pace and she would lose that finger anyway. But she wanted us to try and straighten it, so that's what we did for her. You can be a victim of your own success, and unfortunately, because my mission is intermittent, I sometimes have people who wait for me. This gentleman stuck his finger in boiling cordial. I hope that batch of cordial never made it to the supermarket shelves, but you never know. There's nothing I can do there. Amputation was the only solution. So what are the biological differences? Well, the patients tend to have a different healing pattern and compliance of our patients is a huge problem. With regard to healing, if you look at the picture labeled July, if you saw that in Europe, you would think that is keloid scarring. Keloid scarring does not reverse. Hypertrophic scar does. So if you diagnose that as keloid, you would be wrong. It's hypertrophic. Within six months, it's changed radically. And the problem is, as Europeans, we go over to countries like this, we see cheeks like this little boy on the right, and we put in steroid. Those scars would have resolved anyway, and instead he's ended up with a dent due to the fat hypertrophy with the steroid. Frustrations. My patients are non-compliant. My surgical colleagues do operations back to back and get up to mischief. What is wrong with my patients' patients? Well, basically, this is a population who are treated by NGOs and have become very passive. When they seek treatment, they want to fix. They actually don't want to participate in their, in their progress. When they come to a doctor, they want an operation because they deem that as real treatment. Rehabilitation is really not rated. Wearing splints, pressure garments, and months of physiotherapy is considered a treatment, is considered a challenge rather than a treatment. This is an example. This little boy had a, a malunion of his thumb. I treated it by osteotomy. In Europe, I wouldn't put that big a plaster on there and I would tell his parents how to look after it. In 48 hours, he has managed to trash a plaster of Paris, a dressing and a splint. So I have to see my patients every three days to make sure that they're doing what they should be doing. And this is another case. This was a little girl with bilateral knee contractures released by Z Plasti. She was supposed to be at home on bed rest. You can see where her splints are. You can see the color of her knees and the color of her feet. There's not been a lot of bed resting going on there. And this is the best one. This little child was also on bed rest. Yet when I took his dressing down, not only was it full of sand, but it was soaking wet. He's been in the sea. So 
My local surgeons. Surgeons in Gaza have private practice only. They are paid per operation. There is no follow-up and there is no rehab. If patients go to a surgeon and as a surgeon you do not offer an operation, the patient is likely to think you're no good. This leads to a lot of rather too early and non-relevant surgery. And all over the world, when you're a humanitarian and you're a plastic surgeon, everybody wants to do flaps. Everyone who wants to learn flaps, so when the cat's away, i.e. me, everybody is flapping. This is an example. This was my screening note on this little girl. She'd been burnt three months earlier. I met her for the first time at three months. I said, rehabilitation, co-band, splints, pressure garments, face mask, let her scars develop, let's see what we've got, and then we decide if we need to operate. Came back six months later and she has this small potato has been placed on the back of her hand. Her fingers are now splinted in extension. She can no longer make a fist. She is starting to get growth deformity. So far, three operations later, I've managed to defat the radial side of her flap, recreate her first web and second web. I've still got to do the third web. Unfortunately, for her finances, no, I'll do that, I'll do that. she can now do this. Hmm. She's so fast. Yalla, bad. Yalla, bad. Yalla, bad. Yalla, bad. Yalla, Good girl. So she has passed the Shekel positive test. Next thing is humanitarian tourism, and this is quite sad. What you're seeing there is a thumb reconstruction. I thought I should explain that to you. This little child was bitten by a donkey. A group of microsurgeons came from overseas to do microsurgery. They took his second toe to do a toe-to-hand transfer, which is a fairly acceptable operation, no problem there, but it failed. And instead of doing something simple, when you've done something complicated that's failed, they flipped him over like a small fish and took his latissimus dorsi off his back, more microsurgery, and plonked it on the side of his hand. He now has a functionless blob. His parents have unrealistic expectations because he's had 18 hours of super duper microsurgery and his donor sites are horrible. So what can you do when you're faced with that situation? Well, this is the time when you give the patients a 45 minute consult. You show them what their son can do and the good things about what he can do. You give them advice, you can suggest future surgery, but you certainly send them away to give them time to consider whether they want any more. So what are the reasons for the surgeons behaving like this? Well, some surgeons in a mission context end up with a bigger heart than they have a brain. Not all plastic surgeons are hand trained. Not all surgeons recognize that a physio needs to be part of hand surgery. As I've said before, flap surgeons like to flap. And finally, as I've said before, if you don't want to come back, don't do staged surgery. So how can I respond? Well, this is my little Hamas badge given to me one day by one of my nurses when I was particularly grumpy. You've got to realize no matter how hard it gets, you're just a visitor and you've got a far better life than they have. You've got to say the same things a million times. You don't give up and you try and lead by example. Incidentally, for the junior members of the audience, that's my registrar slide. So what do I do with my team? We make do and we innovate. This is our Gaza handboard made with two Penrose strings, a piece of wood and a gauze swab. A piece of equipment like that in Europe costs $900, the official hand tables. It was conceived by my nurses and me when we couldn't have a hand table of any kind. It's good for big hands, little hands, and it does elevation when you go and get your full thickness skin graft. Now written up in the annals of plastic surgery. We're not divas, we cope with rubbish. This is our hand table. We operated on this for three missions. So if there are any, anyone who can fix my cervical spine in the audience, I would be most grateful. After five years with MSF, they still send me the sutures that I should be using for general war trauma as a general surgeon. The small sutures I actually use are usually stolen from a hospital I'm working at at the time. So how can you deal with that? We've asked them, I don't know how many times for the right sutures. This is me and my charge nurse. The rubbish sutures they send us are actually called Top Joy and Top Joy they ain't. So we use the global team. We make very good electronic notes on all the patients. So if they leave Gaza, they've got a history of what we've done. 
We use the internet. I liaise with Birmingham Children's Hospital because I've worked there intermittently and Edinburgh. I encourage getting the right case to the right NGO. Now I know all the NGOs in Gaza. And what are the perks of this job? Well, I see this in the morning. That's Gaza Beach. I see that at night. I have British art, even in Gaza. My patients respect me. My nurses feed me strawberries. And how do you feel by the end of a mission? This is a sloth at Jerusalem Zoo. This is us at the end of the mission. So why do I do it? To save the world, religion, politics? Well, none of that, because I actually realized from an early stage with Churchill College that I was a very lucky girl. I was given the chance of an excellent education, and thank you, Churchill, because you were the best education I've received during those three years. Nothing subsequently has matched it. But most of all, it's a more basic reason I go. This card was given to me by a friend, and your friends know you well. I'm the girl on the right. I think I'm like all the other surgeons, but I clearly am not. It's all in my little head. So, to the audience, to the undergrads, never believe anyone who says to you you can't study and travel. To the postgrads, there are immense research possibilities, especially genetics overseas. To my consultant colleagues in the audience, you have the last laugh, because having left my consultant post of seven years standing in Edinburgh, these are the two jobs I have left to me. I can either join the circus or join Deliveroo. So for all of you who feel that <laughs> I'm not talking sense, or may I feel that people around the world are very different from you, this is just to show you that we are basically all the same. How many of you can do that? <laughs> so thank you, Churchill, for morphing me from a comprehensive school amoeba to a humanitarian surgeon. And most of all, thank you for my kids from Gaza. Right, now my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Charles Chloe, who's been a consultant ophthalmic, uh, ophthalmic surgeon in London since 1995. Uh, but he's also over 10 years medical legal experience in ophthalmology, and today he's going to talk about I'm going to sue you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so three thanks to start with. Thanks to the organisers for inviting me. Thanks to the audience for staying. I've seen the time. High table waits for no man. Um, but a particular personal and heartfelt thanks to Alan Finlay, for accepting me as a medical student and allowing me to join our wonderful profession, undoubtedly the best career choice anyone could possibly make. So thank you, Alan. Um, you'll see the title has changed. Uh, it's not I'm going to sue you, I'm gonna sue you. Uh, and that's just to explain that that's how it's usually uh, vocalised. Um, my practice is half uh, central London, Harley Street. Um, my NHS practice is East London and Essex. So if I lapse into Essex vernacular, please accept the apologies. Shepherds do become like their sheep. Um, and if I become incomprehensible, could somebody stop me? Um, am I qualified? Well, I'm a Churchill graduate, uh, like you all are. Um, I've got the usual medical spaghetti of qualifications. That's member of the Academy of Experts. So I'm quite serious about uh, the um, medical legal stuff. Um, I'm a consultant ophthalmic surgeon, and I do uh, corneal transplantation. I do salvage surgery, which is uh, basically sorting out other people's difficulties, uh, or cock-ups, as we say in Essex. 
Um, I've got 20 years of uh, NHS experience, 15 years of medical legal, and I am the husband of a barrister. Now, when I tell people, they say, oh, does she make good coffee? And, you know, this is a mistake. She's a frightening lady, but she does do good coffee. <laughs> so, what about I-Law Chambers? Well, it's really quite new. It's basically a fusion of people who do this sort of work seriously and want to do it to a high level. Uh, we only do ophthalmology. We don't do anything else. We never will. Uh, and, you know, the economies of scale, blah, blah. Size allows a data library. But we're going to be the niche market leader by 2020, which is, of course, a really good ophthalmology year. Yeah? 2020? Okay, good. Thank you. So, any lawyers in the audience? Good, so I can be rude about them. Um, you know, we are not lawyers. We are doctors. We do medical legal work, and it's different. Um, and if you think about it, you know, we all do clinical practice, and I, I hope that you do audit to see what you're up to. Yeah? Everybody does that? Um, and then a smaller amount is clinical governance. Uh, and clinical governance is about doing... Uh, an assessment to know when things don't go right. And that's terribly important because if you don't know what going, what's gone wrong, you can't put it right. And then the tiny little bit at the top that I've actually put there because the, the segment is too small is medical legal work. And that is when a patient has been harmed. Now, we don't swear the Hippocratic Oath anymore, but the first thing in the Hippocratic Oath is primum non nocere, first do no harm. And if you do and it was avoidable, then the patient is entitled to some sort of redress. So what do I work as? I work as an expert witness. Sounds terribly grand, doesn't it? What it means is that I have a duty to the court, not the instructing party. So the people who are paying me, I don't owe them a duty. So they get very cross when I say, no, you've got no case. Uh, my job is to explain specialist language and the technical situation to the court so that uh, an elderly judge, if he's still awake, can understand it. And I have to be impartial. So I'm not on anybody's side. And once again, the, uh, you know, patients find that hard to understand. And the legal definition of being impartial is that you give the same answer to whichever side asks. And you mustn't be an advocate. So, and this is where it's quite difficult not to be a doctor. Because as a doctor, we are our patient's advocates. We're there to help the patient. The people who instruct me are not my patient. I do not owe them a duty of care. They are a client on which I am giving an expert opinion. What you can do, though, is you can sneakily act as a medical advisor. You can tell the barrister you know, what the doctor is saying is, is not quite true, actually, and this is the reason it's not quite true. But in front of the court, you are absolutely impartial. And a, a, a problem that doctors frequently do, and Yvette was talking about it a minute ago, is going beyond, beyond your area of expertise. So I'm often asked to say, uh, you know, um, is the injury that this patient has had from tripping over consistent with this hole in the ground? And I have to say, this injury is consistent with falling over, but I'm not an expert on holes in the ground. But as a member of the general public, I think somebody could fall in that hole. And you mustn't think that uh, we are e immune when we uh, uh, do these godlike uh, reports. You can be criticised by judges, and you can be sued by your clients, although actually suing an expert is really quite difficult. Oh, that's not good. That's better. So how does it happen? Well, it starts with a letter, usually a solicitor, sometimes an agency who wants to take part of your fee, sometimes by a litigant in person. So this is a patient who thinks they've got a case and don't want to pay a solicitor. And, you know, they're usually a bit mad, so you don't have to be a <laughs> bit careful with those ones. And the first thing to do is to get a contract, a written agreement, because believe it or not, the biggest problem that experts have is getting paid. If the solicitor doesn't like your report and hasn't paid you, he'll say, well, I won't pay you unless you change this bit because I don't like it. And, you know, this is virtually blackmail, uh, and it's not great. And there are basically two sorts of work. There's personal injury cases. There was a road traffic accident. 
and their liability is usually not contested, and all you do is you do a report on what the patient is like, and you try and guess the future. And then there's alleged clinical negligence. And if I say clinical negligence, for me, it is always alleged clinical negligence. It is for the court to decide whether there was negligence or not. And that's slightly different, because you first have to do a causation and liability report. What caused the problem, and whose liability was it? And then you might do a condition and prognosis report if you think there is a case to answer. And in fact, in many cases, there is no case. It was just a bad outcome. The patient got an infection. And you, the doctor, will never know that I got you off the hook by telling the truth. And that's kind of sad, because I'd like to be able to tell you, but I can't. And sometimes there is a case. And then the lawyers file something called a particulars of claim. Uh, there's a response from the de defendant. The defendant usually conjures up their own expert, who's a bit different, but usually you'd be surprised how often experts agree. We have a joint meeting and send a document to the court that says, we agree on X, Y, Z, P, Q, but we disagree on W. And then there might be a trial. But in fact, in ophthalmology, uh, claims are not usually very high. They're about 80,000 pounds to 150,000. And the cost of going to court and the risk of going to court is too high. It's only when the claims go over a million that they're likely to go to court. And that does happen from time to time. So I am not a lawyer. But I've been doing this a bit. So I think this is what it is. For a clinical act to be negligent, there have to be three things. There has to be a duty of care. And usually, that's not disputed. And then there was. Is there a breach of duty of care? And that means something that no reasonable, reputable practitioner would do. And then thirdly, did harm follow? And it's only if harm follows causality that there is a case. So take an example in ophthalmology. Patient comes in with two equal cataracts, supposed to have a right cataract operation. Some cock up means they get a left cataract operation. By chance, the power of the interocular lens is the same. They get a good result. They're perfectly happy. They can't see you for negligence because there is no harm. I still would be careful what you do. Help. Oh, there we go. So the legal tests. You just need to know a little bit about these three. So the Bolam test, which dates back to 1957, which was by a, a quite low-level judge called McDare, says that you will be not acting negligently if you follow a reasonable body of professionals skilled in the art. So you don't have to be the best doctor in the world. You can even be below average. But if you can show that other people would have done the same thing, that's great. Um, unfortunately, the lawyers think that it's too easy to avoid prosecution. Uh, but nobody's come up with a better definition. And then there's the Belitho case, which is a House of Lords case. And this says, yeah, that's fine, but the doctor's got to be logical. So you chop off the right leg instead of the left leg. You find three professors who say, yeah, I'd have chopped off the right leg in the same circumstances. And the law says, no, come on, you've chopped off the wrong leg, and you, know, you can't get out of it like that. And you know, I, I think we'd all agree with that. And then there's Montgomery. Now, that's quite, quite recent, and it's a Supreme Court case. And it's about consent. And what it says is that you have to tell a patient all the material risks that a reasonable patient would want to know. The trouble is that this judgment is retrospective. So anything consents you've had in the past can be attacked under Montgomery. Um, and it's, it's really quite problematic at the moment. And there have not been many cases since. So let's just look at consent in a little bit more. Uh, no. Um, where could it all go wrong? Well, I think there are six places where it can go wrong, and let's just go through them. So, you know, in the NHS, we're obsessed with the, hello, my name is. And actually, that's not what matters. It's, who are you? Uh, ask them their name. Don't say, your turn, Mrs. Jones. And please, if it's a Jones or a Smith or a Mountbatten or a Windsor, you know, what is your first name? Are you Shirley Jones or are you Sandra Jones? And then the diagnosis. You don't, uh, a wise man told me you don't have to be right 
you only have to be reasonable. And this is absolutely true. Uh, and Bolam applies. So if you could show that other people would have made the same diagnosis, then you know, you're perfectly safe. And then there's the consent. Now, you have to have a discussion with the patient. You have to use simple words. You have to tell them about common complications. You do have to talk about worst case scenarios. So in my sort of business, you have to tell people that you could be blind or you could be dead, which considering that cataract surgery is the commonest and one of the safest operations there is, tells me that the law is ridiculous. But that's what Montgomery makes us do now. What about the operation? Oh, no, we're going to do a little bit more on consent. So what is consent? It's permission by a patient with capacity, i.e. they can understand and decide, for an examination or a procedure after an explanation of the material risks and an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, the problem is, you know, what is a material risk? Well, Montgomery said, the judgment, that a material risk is what a reasonable patient would wish to know and does not depend on the percentage frequency. So if it's very rare, like dying from cataract surgery, but very serious, death is kind of serious, then you still have to tell them. Unfortunately, where the Supreme Court has completely let us down is by not telling us what a reasonable patient is. Anybody here met a reasonable patient? <laughs> no, I haven't either. Now, there's a legal fiction that a reasonable patient is the man on the Clapham omnibus, but since there are no longer om omnibuses in Clapham, I have no idea what a reasonable patient is. Well, there are different sorts of consent. There's implied, so, you know, please lean forward so that I can examine you. There is verbal, can I put some eye drops in? And, but there is written consent. And if you're doing any significant uh, procedure or doing any intimate examination, then perhaps a written consent should be considered mandatory at this stage. So what about consent for cataract surgery? Um, you know, you have to tell the patient in the NHS about all the options even if they're not available in the NHS. That's Montgomery for you. So you have to tell an 84-year-old with bad cardiorespiratory disease that they could have a general anaesthetic, which they might want, which might not be a clever idea. You have to tell them about the sort of lenses that the NHS will not fund to the extraordinary amazement of the rest of the civilised world that will allow them to see either in distance without glasses or distance and near without glasses. You have to tell patients that they can have both eyes operated on on the same day, which many of us think that for bilateral disease is by far the best way to do it. And it goes without saying, I hope, that you have to tell them that no treatment is an option. Did I say something? So, what do you do when you've got consent? Well, please write it down. You know, verbal consent obtained. That's all you need. And then, please make it legible. Uh, how long does it last? Consent is eternal unless revoked. So, when the nurse comes and says, this consent form is three months old, can you do another one? You know, no, you don't have to, but it might actually be easier to do it in terms of saving time. So, let's take some scenarios. The patient doesn't have capacity. They're... Uh, mentally subnormal, um, what have you. Uh, get relatives involved, get them to agree, uh, and often having a second consultant saying that it's in the patient's best interest uh, is a good idea. And then the patient has some capacity. So, and this is quite common. The patient has perhaps mild dementia. The family are determined that they're going to have a cataract operation, but the patient says, no, I'm perfectly happy with my vision. The patient is sovereign. Even if the family threaten you, either with a bus stop or with a solicitor, the patient is sovereign. And then there are communication issues. Well, this is great. You know, if you can't communicate, you can't give consent. You have to establish uh, communication with an independent person. One of my colleagues was served up with, you know, one of our typical East End Indian patients in the country for 30 years, speaks no English. Um, and uh, he likes to operate on these patients under local anaesthetic. Well, the patient, as soon as he was draped, started jumping around and thrashing around, and it turned out that the family had not told him he was coming for a cataract operation. 
So, uh, yes, well, uh, get proper consent. And then, you know, we, we eye doctors do most of our surgery under local anesthetic, and this is the nightmare scenario when the patient um, decides in the middle of the operation they don't want it. You must stop. If you do not, you are committing battery with actual or grievous bodily harm. So whatever the surgery is, stop, put a dressing on, talk to the patient. If they won't let you continue, send them to the ward, go and talk to them later, and get senior staff involved. And that might be the hospital director or the medical director or somebody like that, because if they won't let you at least uh, uh, render the wound safe, there's going to be a problem. What about the operation? Well, please do the correct operation. So if you're doing six cataracts and one squint on your list, please don't do seven cataracts. Please do it on the right side, which might be the left side. So do it on the relevant side. Never ask a patient which side are you having it on, because every so often you meet a clever one who says, yes, well, my right is the surgeon's left, so I will say left. Oh, dear. This is embarrassing, isn't it? This is to remind me that at this sort of time I go to mass. Uh, so, um, but not tonight. And then the usual thing, you know, please make sure you do the right operation on the right side of the right patient. Aftercare, again, are you seeing the right patient for the notes in front of you? In the NHS, we just can't remember our patients. So many of them are thrown at us and do roughly what everybody else would do. And then the records. Now, the problem here is that bad records are the main reason why people have to settle. And that, in turn, is because we are taught to do records to help the next doctor who sees the patient, not some barrister who will spend two days going through every minute brush stroke trying to work out uh, what you meant and what you didn't do. And finally, and I shouldn't need to say this, should I? Be nice. You know, um, patients don't sue doctors they have a good relationship with. Um, and the more things are going wrong, the more time you should be able to spend with them. And, you know, a, a general doctoring rule, if you can't do anything else for the patient, just sit and talk to them for a bit. They really appreciate it. So how can you protect yourself? Coming to the end. So uh, you've got uh, eight things here. Is it the right patient? Do they have capacity? Make a reasonable diagnosis. Have a watertight consent. Do the correct operation on the correct side. Don't exceed your competence. Ask for help soonest. Now, I think this is a problem in the NHS. People seem to think that asking for a second opinion is a sign of weakness or failure. And it isn't. It's a sign of strength. Because most second opinions come back, yeah, I do exactly the same thing but it really is supportive for you and your patient. And keep perfect notes and give the patient chair time if they need it. So there's a, a very quick uh, gamble through Medical Eagle. And uh, uh, there are lots of things that I can't change. And I do hope that some of this is going to be provided in the near future. <laughs> Thank you very much for staying this late for me.